أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله قاسم الجبارين مبير الظالمين مدرك الهاربين نكال الظالمين السريخ المستسرخين موضع حاجات الطالبين معتمد المؤمنين ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا وحبيب قلوبنا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين أما بعد سلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته One of the names of Lady Fatima عليها السلام is that she is known as محدثة محدثة means that she has narrated the ahadith of the Prophet of Allah for us Another name of Lady Fatima is محدثة not with a kasra, but with a fatha, muhaddatha. And muhaddatha means one who has received inspiration, one who has received um, narration from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the angel Jibra'il or another angel. And sometimes it can be difficult for us to explain how is it possible that one who is not a prophet can receive divine inspiration and can see angels and receive inspiration from angels. Therefore, one of the examples that we have in the Qur'an is the example of Lady Maryam alayha salam, the mother of Prophet Isa. And the Qur'an says to us, وَإِذْ قَالَتِ الْمَلَائِكَةُ يَا مَرْيَمُ And remember the time when the angels said to Lady Maryam, O Maryam, يَا مَرْيَمُ قُنُتِي لِرَبِّكِ Humble yourself in the presence of God. Wasjudi and prostrate to God. Warka'i ma'ar raki'een. And do ruku' with those who do ruku'. The commentators of the Qur'an have interpreted this expression in two ways. One, it could mean that when you offer your ibadah, offer it in jama'ah. Do ruku' with those who are doing ruku'. And the second interpretation given by the commentators is to say, Oh Maryam, do ruku with the rest of creation that is in its own way becoming humble in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is an example of a person who is not a prophet receiving divine inspiration and being able to see the angel when they are receiving the inspiration. And tonight, inshallah, we would like to talk about the ruku' itself, which is the next step in our salat, which comes after we recite the Surah Al-Fatiha and the other Surah. In a hadith of the sixth holy Imam, Al-Imam As-Sadiq alayhi yaftalu salati wa salam. He says that the ruku' is etiquette and the sujood is closeness. And I'm paraphrasing this hadith. It is not exactly the way it was said by the sixth imam. He says that, for example, when you go to a king and you want to be close to a king, first you have to show proper etiquette and then the king or the ruler will draw you closer to him. In the same way the imam says, if you want to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the sujood, and the closest a person gets to God is in the state of sujood, then he says, first you will have to observe the etiquettes of ruku. That will make you deserve being in the state of sujood. 
Today, we want to break the discussion down into two parts. In the first part, very briefly, we want to talk about some of the ahkam of the ruku. And then in the second part, we want to talk about some of the etiquettes of the ruku. And with every etiquette, there is a life-changing lesson that we can learn from it. So coming to the ahkam of the ruku, the scholars say that ruku is one of the arkan of the salat. Meaning if a person intentionally or unintentionally does not say a ruku in a rak'ah of salat, then his salat is batil. Okay? And therefore they say, after you are, have recited Surah Al-Fatiha and the second surah, after that, go in the state of ruku. And you should bow as much. The minimum amount of bowing that is required is that your hands would be able to reach your knees. That much is necessary. Okay? Now when we talk about the adab of salat, I will share with you the sunnah of the Holy Prophet and how much he used to bow in his ruku. But the minimum is that a person should be at least able to make their hands reach their knees. And when a person is in the state of ruku, they should either recite Subhanallah, 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 or recite Subhana Rabbi al Azimi wa bihamdi at least once, or any dhikr whose length is the same as this particular dhikr. Okay? Now, inshallah, in the adab, we will talk about what are some of the recommendations that can also be added to this recitation of the ruku. Coming to the adab of the ruku, tonight I'd like to share with you three of the adab of ruku. The first adab of ruku is that a person should bend so much that his back should become flat, especially for the brothers. Okay? It is part of the sunnah of the Prophet of Allah that when he used to bend, his back would be perpendicular to his feet. In fact, in the narration, the exact text of the narration says that his back was so flat that if you poured water, not a glass of water, but if you actually poured water on his back, it would not flow in any direction. Now maybe that was a little bit of an exaggeration, we do not know. But whoever observed the Prophet of Allah doing ruku, he saw the Prophet of Allah to be very perpendicular. However, what is interesting is that this sunnah is for men. This sunnah of the Prophet is not for women. Women are not expected to bow until their backs are perpendicular to their feet. In fact, you will find that in a number of places in our salat, some of the etiquettes and adab for women are different than the ones for men. When men stand, their feet can be or should be a little bit apart. When women are standing, the recommendation is that their feet should be together. When, women, when men are in sujood, it is recommended to raise the elbows so that it is visible, right? For women, when they are in sujood, it is recommended to put the elbows on the ground and as close to the body as possible. When women are standing up, they're told first, bring your hands close and then rise up. You have to wonder why. This is because this is more appropriate for the haya of women. Islam does not like the shape of a woman's body to be visible in the presence of one who is not mahram. Or even for her to be in a habit where the shapes of her body would be visible. The concept of haya is a very important concept in Islam. Islam is not only demanding hijab. Islam demands haya. And let me begin first by giving a definition for haya. Haya means that men and women will interact and present themselves in a manner in society, in their dressing, in their gazing, in their speaking, in their interaction, in their physical touch, in how close or how far they stand away from each other, in a manner that does not attract the attention of the opposite gender in a negative manner. Okay? This is very important to Islam. 
And in this society, in modern societies, I mean, this becomes very important. Because in modern societies, unfortunately, we have a culture of objectification. And Islam is opposed to the culture of objectification. One of the reasons that Islam has imposed hijab on men and women is because it does not like the culture of objectification. What is this culture? A thing is said to be an object when we use it for another purpose. When we strip it of its own will. When we don't think of it in a dignified manner. For example, a car is an object. Why? Because another person uses it for the purpose of transportation. A cell phone is an object because it's a tool that another person will use at his own discretion for the purpose of communication. You find in modern societies, human beings have been turned into objects that are being used for another purpose. They are used for selling product. These days, sometimes you come across an advertisement on TV. Brothers say you don't even know what the advertisement is about until the last second of the advertisement. The rest of it is just attraction. Right? Using a woman's body to sell product. Using that to sell news as well. You will notice one thing in Western media outlets. No matter how smart a lady journalist is, how experienced she is, how educated she is, whatever are her credentials, but the moment she wants to become an anchor person on TV and she wants to come on live TV, she is expected to dress in a particular manner, in a very liberal manner. Otherwise, there is no importance given to her. That's a culture that strips dignity away from human beings. And we live in a society where celebrities and actors and musicians are the ones dictating to us how to dress. They are giving us the standards of beauty. What are the dimensions that a person has to have for society to consider that person to be beautiful? And these dimensions and expectations are so unrealistic that it creates so much frustration in society. So much frustration in a family as well. Why? All for the purpose of using one person's body for the purpose of gratifying another human being. This is a culture of objectification. And sometimes it surprises me that some of the mu'mineen and the mu'minat would take such people as role models. These are not good role models for us. You will find that these people are sometimes some of the most insecure people that you will ever come across in your life. I was reading once that one of these celebrities, <clears throat> she says that I have millions of followers on Instagram. Whenever I post a picture, I get millions of comments or I get thousands, tens of thousands of comments and responses. And every once in a while, I like to take a selfie of myself and post it on my Instagram account. And the moment I do that, immediately I get comments and likes. Right? And people tell me how good I look and how amazing I look. I'll get tens of thousands of comments like that immediately. And then she says, but there will always be a few people who will write some nasty comments. And they will tell me how ugly I look. And she says, because of those few comments, which number in the tens only, for days I will not get sleep. Some of the most insecure people that you will come across, why would we take them to be our role models when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us better than them? But we live in a culture which objectifies human beings, in particular objectifies women. To the point that you find today in Western societies, 
girls in particular do not want to go to school or dread going to school, especially in high school. Statistics are mind-boggling because when they go there, they will be judged and they have to live up to a standard that is not a realistic standard. Islam does not like that. And therefore, Islam, hijab, hijab is a symbol of combat against a culture of objectifying human beings. The hijab empowers a human being. The hijab empowers a woman, gives her control of her image, gives her control over her own body, where she says that you will not appreciate me because of the way I dress or because of the way I look today. Rather, you will be forced to appreciate me for my achievement, for my intellect, for my uh, uh, successes that I have had in my life. And therefore you find that even in the ruku, given the choice between expressing humbleness and expressing modesty, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we want modesty from you and that is how you're going to express your humility and humbleness. The second adab that we have in the ruku is the elongation of the neck. In the ahadith we are taught that when you go in the state of ruku, you should stretch out your neck. The chin should not be closer to the chest. The chin should be away from the chest, as if the neck were to be exposed. In Arabic, this is known as maddul unuq, to elongate the unuq, the neck. Somebody asked the first holy Imam, Amir al Mu'mineen, alayhi yaftalu salati wa salam. He said, O oh son of the uncle of the best of God's creatures, Explain to me what is the meaning of maddul unuq fil ruku'i faqala ta'wiluhu amantu billahi walaw duribat unuqi the true meaning of that is that i shall always believe in god even if my head is separated from my body it's an expression of commitment to faith it's an expression of commitment to values this is one of the lessons that we take away from the ruku. Commitment and perseverance is the key to success in life. Whether we want to achieve something in this world or we want to achieve something in the hereafter, the key to success is commitment. Many a times you find that we do not see the effects of our faith because we lack in commitment, we lack in consistency, and we lack in perseverance. Now you find that at some point in everybody's life, they may lack some level of commitment. Maybe there was a time in my life when I would miss my Fajr prayers, for example, or I couldn't always wake up for the Fajr prayers. Maybe there was a time in my life that I wasn't committed to the hijab the way I should be committed to the hijab. I wanted to come to the masjid on a regular basis, but I did not have the opportunity to do that. I wanted to serve in the community, but my studies and my work and my other priorities did not allow me to do that. I wanted to learn about the religion, read books about the religion, but I lacked in commitment and motivation at that time. And Islam is a beautiful religion. Islam doesn't say it's all or nothing. You either do everything or you stop doing everything, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the little that we do, He still accepts it from us. The first Imam, in a beautiful hadith, He says, مَا لَا يُدْرَكْ كُلُّ لَا يُتْرَكْ جُلُّ If you can't get everything of something, then don't even leave everything. Do the best that you can do. But there has to come a point in our life after listening to so many majalis in the month of Muharram and majalis in the month of Ramadan and going for so many majlises and listening to so many marthiyas and nawhas, there has to come a point in my life where I say to myself, I need to commit myself to the faith, the values of the faith. 
Now I have to submerge myself in the value system of Islam. Migrate from one way of life into another way of life without looking behind. And initially it's going to be difficult. Initially you may not get all the support that you want to get. Initially it may be difficult to be consistent. But you find in life whenever you want to achieve something, the key to it is commitment and perseverance. Think about a person who wants to lose weight or they want to work out at the gym and build some body muscle to show off to their brothers in faith, for example. Or somebody who wants to lose weight so that they can fit into a dress that they used to fit in once upon a time. And they go to a trainer and they say, help me out here. And what does the trainer say? The trainer says to this person, if you want to lose weight, then you have to get serious about it. Every day, you have to come to the gym. Every day, you have to work out like clockwork. Every day, you have to hit the treadmill for 20 or 30 minutes. Right? This has to be your program every day. There are some things that you have to do every day. Okay? And there are some things that you have to stay away from. No more junk food. You can't be a couch potato anymore holding a remote control in one hand and a bag of chips on the other hand and changing channels on TV, that's not going to work, okay? So he tells you some things you have to do, some things that you have to stay away from, and you have to come to the gym, right? And when you find it difficult, he's going to tell you, look, if you want to be successful, the key to success is commitment. I need your commitment if you want me to help you to lose weight. If we have to work so hard to build our physique for our physical health, what about our spiritual health? Doesn't that need commitment as well? Now just as we have a gym for working out, we also have a spiritual gym. The spiritual gym is the is a masjid. Right? Just as you have a workout schedule for every day, you also have a spiritual workout as well. That spiritual workout is the salat. Right? And just as we have to stay away from eating certain things, we also have to stay away from certain actions if we want to see results in our lives. Okay? If we want to taste the sweetness of faith, then we have to have commitment. Now, in Arabic, in the Quran, the word for commitment and the word for perseverance is Sabr. Sabr has a very wide meaning in the Quran. Sabr does not just mean patience. In fact, patience is the lowest level of sabr. They are higher levels of sabr. Where a person has the option. See, normally we don't have an option, so we are patient. But sometimes you have an option and you still choose not to exercise that option because you want to get with the program. So let me share a hadith with you. This hadith comes to us, I believe, from the sixth Imam, Al Imam Al Sadiq, alayhi afdalu salati wa salam. He says, Iza kana yawmul qiyamah, when the day of judgment arrives, yaqumu unukum min al nasi fayatuna bab al jannah. A group of people will rise suddenly and they will come to the doors of paradise. Now you know on the day of judgment, nobody is allowed to move except the one who has been given permission from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَخَشَعَتِ الْأَصْوَاتُ لِلرَّحْمَانِ فَلَا تَسْمَعُ إِلَّا حَمْسَةً On that day, even the voices will become silent in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Except for this group of people, very audaciously, they will just stand up, come to the doors of Jannah and start knocking at the doors of Jannah saying, let us in. Okay? So when they do that, the angels will say to them, فَيُقَالُوا مَنْ أَنْتُمْ They will be asked, who are you people? They will respond by saying, نَحْنُ أَهْلُ sabri. We are the people of sabr. So then the angels will ask them, and what is the sign of your sabr? فَيَقُولُونَ عَلَى مَا صَبِرْتُمْ 
What were you so patient about? They will respond by saying, فَيَقُولُونَ كُنَّا نَصْبِرُ عَلَىٰ طَاعَةِ اللَّهِ We used to persevere in what? Persevere in the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَنَصْبِرُ عَنْ مَعَاصِيِ اللَّهِ And we used to persevere from disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَيَقُولُ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلَّ At that moment, God will say, صَدَقُوا They have spoken the truth. أَدْخِلُوهُمُ الْجَنَّةِ Allow them to enter paradise. And this is what God means. يُوَفَّ الصَّابِرُونَ أَجْرَهُمْ بِغَيْرِ حِسَاب These people will enter Jannah without any hisab, without any kitab. There is no accounting for them. They just walk to the doors of Jannah. They knock at the doors of Jannah and they walk into Jannah. Where does that come from? From sabr. From commitment, from perseverance, from consistency, and remaining on the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the second message that we take away from the ruku' today. And the third message that we can take away from the ruku' is that when a person enters into the state of ruku', one of the etiquettes is that he should have tuma'nina. His body should come to rest at that time. After a person has recited the second surah and he said takbir, he goes in the state of ruku. When he has reached the state of ruku and the body has come to a standstill, at that time he should recite the dhikr and he should spend time in reciting the dhikr. We are told that yes, it is only wajib to recite subhana rabbi al azimi wa bihamdi once. However, it is also mustahab to recite salawat after that. It is the sunnah of the Prophet to recite it three times. Or it is even fadl if a person has time. Sometimes we get some extra time to recite it seven times in the ruku or in the sujood itself. And then when he is done with that, when he has ceased to recite, then he should stand up, come back in the state of qiyam before going in the state of sujood. One day the Prophet of Allah was in the masjid. Somebody entered the masjid and he started to say his salat. And this person was not completing his ruku properly. He was not completing his sujood properly. You may have seen sometimes a person goes once and comes up, goes down and he comes up. The Prophet of Allah looking at him said, this is like the pecking of the crows. Let me read the Arabic for you. The Prophet says, Naqara ka naqaratil ghurab. He is pecking the way the crows are pecking on the ground. Lain ma tahada wa hakada salatu. If this person was to die, and this is the nature of his prayer, la yamutanna ala ghayri dini. He will have died, but not on my religion, on some other religion. Now, you find that there's a very important message for life to be taken away from this. The ruku and the sujood forces us to slow down our lives. We're always in a rush. We are always in a haste. Our lives have become very fast. Life has nowadays become a rat race. We're always running from one activity to another activity. And we have become masters at multitasking. And what multitasking means is when you are working on one activity, you are thinking about a, another activity, something else that you want to be doing at that time, or something else that you're going to do after that. When we are driving, instead of looking around, we are thinking about what do I have to do when I get to the next place, for example. Right? And therefore, we have lost the ability to live in the moment, to appreciate the simple pleasures of life. And therefore you find sometimes life is not pleasurable for us. What the Ahlul Bayt salam, teach us, they say every moment should be given its own due respect. You find that today, for example, when we sit down at the dinner table, it's very different from the way it used to be in the past. Nowadays, sometimes instead of sitting at the table, 
we sit on the couches and everybody is watching a game. Although our bodies are seated together, our hearts are much far apart from each other. We are all in our own worlds. Or even if we sit at the dinner table itself, everybody's got a gadget in his hands. Somebody's reading the news, somebody is madly texting away and WhatsApping, you know, as if if I don't reply in the next five seconds, the whole world is going to come to an end, right? That's how fast we're expected to respond, yeah? And somebody is watching YouTube clips and documentaries that you have other time to watch it as well. The dinner time is one of those times where we build family ties, where we share a family vision, where we talk about our common problems, where we come to understand what is the problem that you face in your school today? Tell me about it. I would like to hear about it. That's what the dinner table is supposed to be about. And the Prophet of Allah has taught this 1400 years ago. I want to share with you a hadith. But let me first share a preamble to this particular hadith. In this hadith we're told, now this hadith talks about i'tikaf. Many of you know what i'tikaf is. At least going three days into the masjid, and when you are there in the masjid, you are either praying salat, or reciting Quran, or reciting ziyara, or reciting dua, or listening to a lecture, or reflecting over the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. During the time of the Holy Prophet, his i'tikaf was not three days. His i'tikaf was 10 days. Okay? He used to start in the first 10 days of Ramadan, and then the, later on in his life, he made it the second 10 days of Ramadan. And then the battle of Badr happened to be on the 17th of Ramadan. Then towards the end of his life, he would do the last 10 days of the month of Ramadan. He would take his bed to the masjid, and he would remain there until the day of Eid. That was a'tikaf for the Prophet of Allah. Now listen to this hadith. In this hadith, it is narrated that the Holy Prophet has said, Julusul mar'i inda When a man sits down with his family, meaning he takes time away from his business, time away from his friends, sits down with them, talks to them, empathizes with them. The Prophet of Allah says, that is more beloved, ahabbu ilallahi azza wa jalla more beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that 15 20 minutes that you spend with your family and you live in the moment at that time and you enjoy your children and you enjoy their presence that 15 minutes is more beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala min i'tikafin from doing i'tikaf where fi masjidi not in this masjid in the masjid of the Prophet in the city of Medina. But our lives have become very busy. Even in our cars, you notice. You must have seen that these days they have cars which have screens in the back right? for kids to see. And sometimes we like to have those cars. Now, I'm not judging people. People buy those cars for different reasons. And Allahu A'lam what their reasoning is. But sometimes a person may find that that car is a very comfortable car. Because once I get that car and I put something on the screen for my children to watch, then there's no more whining in the car. There's no more screaming in the car. I have a built-in babysitter in the car for me. And I can continue about my life without having to worry about my children at that time. My question would be, why would you ever do that to your children? In this life that God has given you, why would you ever do that to your children? I'm not just talking about, you know, having screens in the car. Even giving a screen, an iPad or a gadget. Do they not get enough time at home that even in the car, instead of looking at God's creation and looking at people and thinking about people and asking you about people, that they still have to look at these screens? In the car, when you're driving back home, you're driving to a place 
What an opportunity that is to talk to your children. Baba, what did you learn at the madrasa today? What do you think about what the alim said or the speaker said in the lecture today? Let's talk about it. Let's build values, shared values as a family. And then if you find later on when the child grows up to be 16, 17, 18 and their values are so different from your values and you want to know how that happened, well, look at that day in the car. That's how it happened. Right? Islam teaches us that everything has a time of day dedicated to it. In the hadith, the imam says, divide your day into four parts. The first part of the day or one part of the day for worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One part of the day for resting. One part of the day for working. And one part of the day for enjoying life. In doing those things which are not haram. Every day a person should have some time where they relax in doing those things which are not haram. Then the Ahlul Bayt teaches, when you're engaged in one thing, then focus on it. Give that thing its due. When it's time to play with children, play with them and enjoy their presence. You know the Prophet of Allah, when he used to, the Prophet, who used to be a warrior on the battlefield, the commander of the Muslim community, the political leader facing so many challenges, right? people asking him question after question. When the Prophet of Allah used to play with children, he would become like children. In one beautiful hadith, once Bilal went looking for the Holy Prophet because he couldn't find him in the masjid and they wanted to start the salat. And he found that the Prophet of Allah was playing with children at that time. They came to the Holy Prophet and they said to him, Ya Rasulullah, kun jamali. You know what that means? That means, O Prophet of Allah, become my camel. You know, sometimes you go on all fours and you put your children on your back. These children had seen the Prophet of Allah doing that with Imam al Hassan and Imam al Hussein. So they ran up to him and said, Ya Rasulullah, why don't you also be a camel for us? You know what the Prophet did? With children, he was like children. He went down and put them on his back and he started to give them a ride. It's there in the hadith. Bilal comes to the Holy Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, we've got important business. We need to get back. And the Prophet of Allah said, not like that. I can't just leave these children. Go to my home and find out if they have any food. So Bilal goes to the house of the Prophet. And he says, in this house, is there any food? And they said, yes, there are some walnuts. Eight walnuts in total. How many walnuts? Eight. He says, Ya Rasulullah, I went to your house, there was nothing but eight walnuts. The Prophet of Allah turned to the children and said to them, Are you willing to sell your camel for eight walnuts? The sweetness of the Holy Prophet when he was with the children, enjoying the moment with them. And they say to him, Yes, Ya Rasulullah, children, when they saw food, sometimes they forget parents as well, right? So they said, Yes, we will take it. And the Prophet smiled. And he said, my brother Yusuf was sold, بِبِضَاعَةٍ uh, who was sold for دَرَاهِمَ مَعْدُودَ وَشَرَوْهُ بِثَمَنٍ بَخْسٍ دَرَاهِمَ مَعْدُودَ They sold him for a few meager coins when they first brought him into Egypt. And these children have sold me for eight walnuts as well. The Prophet smiled and he went on. When the Prophet used to eat, then he would be engaged in it. And it is narrated that the Prophet has said, that the time that you spend eating is time that will not be taken away from your life. When the Prophet was praying, his focus was on praying itself. What is the Prophet of Allah teaching us over here? He's teaching us that life needs to slow down. Everything has its moment. When you're engaged in one activity, then give it the attention that that activity deserves. Don't be always thinking about the next activity or something else that you want to do. And that is a lesson that we learned from the adab of the ruku and the sujood. The practice of tuma'nina, slowing down and reciting the dhikr of the salat and the dhikr of ruku when the body has come to rest. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Given that it is Thursday night, <clears throat> 
we would like to remember Imam al Hussein and the Aza of Imam al Hussein. We take our hearts to Karbala and imagine ourselves Bainul Haramain between the Haram of Abbas and Hussein. Let us do tawassul to our Imam that on this night in the month of Ramadan, he gives us the tawfiq to fulfill the rights of the month of Ramadan and accepts our a'mal that we have performed so far. Ya Aba Abdillah, Ya Hussein ibn Ali, Ayyuha al-Shaheed, Ya ibn Rasulillah, Ya Hujjat Allah, Ala Khalqin, Ya Sayyidana wa Mawlana, Inna tawajjahna wa istashfa'na, وتوسلنا بك إلى الله وقدمناك بين يدي حاجاتنا يا وجيها عند الله اشفع لنا عند الله يا وجيها عند الله Last night remembered Lady Khadija alayhi salam and how she helped the Prophet of Allah in his mission and how she consoled him in moments of difficulty and how she supported him in some of the most difficult moments of his mission. And we say, O oh Lady Khadija, your example remained in your posterity. O oh Lady Khadija, when we go to the plains of Karbala, we see another Khadija like you. She was Lady Zainab alayhi salam. And tonight we want to remember Lady Zainab and the support that she gave to Imam al Hussein and the difficulties that she faced on the way. The narrator says when they reached Karbala, one day Imam al Hussein was sharpening his sword and he was reciting some lines of poetry. And the Imam recited, Ya Dahrafil Laka min Khalini. He said, Oh, time, what a bad friend you are. He recited some lines of poetry. And then he said, Surely the affairs return to Allah. When Lady Zainab alayhi salam heard this, she said, O oh, Hussein is reciting his own Marathiya. Hussein is telling us that he will be passing away. And Imam al Hussein said to her, O oh, Zainab, be patient. On the day of Ashura, there were many difficulties. She went up the hills of Zainabiya. And what did she see from that place? She saw the enemies attacking Imam al Hussein with their arrows and their spears, with their stones and their swords. They were attacking Abu Abdullah al Hussein. On the night after the day of Ashura, the narrator says, as they were running from tent to tent, Finally, Shimr came into the tent of Imam al sajjad Narrated in the books of history, imagine Imam al sajjad looking at Shimr, holding the very sword which was dripping with the blood of Imam al Hussein. Shimr said, I'm going to kill him as well. Somebody said to him, are you going to kill those who are sick? He said, indeed, I will kill them as well. At that moment, the narrator says, Zainab alayhi salam threw herself between Shimr and Imam al-Sajjad. And she said, if you want to kill him, first you will have to kill me and remove me from the path. That is Zainab alayhi salam 
But the most difficult moment was the next day when they were leaving Karbala. And they say, do not make us pass by the body of Imam al Hussein. But they were made to pass by the body of al Hussein. When they saw the body of the Imam lying on the plains of Karbala, covered in his own blood, covered in the sand of Karbala. With so many injuries on the body that remained uncovered on the plains of Karbala, Lady Zainab threw herself onto the ground. She put her hands under the body of Imam Al Hussein and she turned to Allah and she said, Rabbana, taqabbal minna hadha al Qurban. Oh Allah, accept the sacrifice from us and then according to some narrators she turned to the city of Medina or she turned to the sky and she said wa Muhammad salla alayka malika sama may Allah send his salawat upon you hadha Husaynun murammalun biddima this is your Husayn he is covered in his own blood Muqatta his limbs have been severed from him sabaya and these are your daughters and they're being taken prisoners from Karb Inna lillahi wa inna